Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Heidi McIntosh, I'm the City Archivist. Um, thank you for attending our first ever Wolverhampton History Week. Um, before we, we start, just a few kind of housekeeping bits. If you could ideally turn your microphones off and mute it throughout the event so we don't have any background noise while Jackie's talking. Um, the event will also be recorded, so if you don't want to appear on camera, then turn your cameras off. Um, if you're fine appearing on camera, then that's fine too. Um, if you can use, uh, Jackie will take questions at the end, so if you can use the chat box at the bottom of Zoom to send your question to the speaker and then we can filter the questions back to Jackie when we come back to it. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Jackie Harrison who's going to talk to us about the melee in the market. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Whoops. Hang on, I'm getting there, share. Yay. Okay. This is going to fill your screen. If you find that the boxes on the right hand side are obstructing your view where you've got the little thumbnails of us, um, somewhere in your view at the top right hand corner of your screen, you've probably got a little box of dots and in there you can choose to do something different with the way you actually view it. So, Melee in the market. Anybody who has read or even just dipped into um, the official history of Wolverhampton by Mandra and Tildesley will have seen this referred to. Um, it's mentioned elsewhere as well, but um, this is where I actually first found it. And then a few years after that, when I found out that you could actually buy digitised items of documents from the National Archives for you to peruse at home and be as nosy as you like about who said what about who. Um, well, that was the first set of documents I bought. So, melee in the market. The year is 1534. It's a nice early summer's day, June the 10th. And to be more specific, it's a Wednesday, which means it's market day in 16th century Wolverhampton. The image in the background isn't meant to be Wolverhampton. We don't really know what it looked like, although probably markets look like markets everywhere. We do know where it was, but the only way we can demonstrate that really, I'm afraid, is to shoot forward 230 years and have a look at um, the 1750 map of Wolverhampton by Isaac Taylor. Um, that's quite a big map, that's the whole of the township as it was called then, we don't need all of it, we just need this little bit in the middle, so if we just zoom in on that little bit, we don't really want all of that, but places to sort of hang the story on are uh, the Angel Inn, down the bottom there, after the Blue Arrow, uh, the Swan Inn next door, or Red, those two building sites are now covered by both halves of Lloyd's Bank. Um, the area where the market has been held for a long time is this green edged area here. We call it Queen Square these days, back then it was high green. I'm not entirely sure whether the town hall that's marked on this map in that area or the corn market were there in 1534. I've actually tried to find out but I can't find any specific reference to it at the moment. And, um, and then at the end, I just want to have a quick little look at that whirly whirly purple thing there, which contains uh, Lucens High Hall and the Deanery Hall, which is up there. In terms of what it might have looked like, the market, again, in the 18th century, really, the nearest we can get to is Turner's view of High Green, which is from 1795. I mean, it's quite clear that St. Peter's Church in the background. Um, and then a few years later on, four years later on, there's a very similar view, um, but done in a much less sort of um, busy fashion. So that's uh, Rowlandson's 1799 view. But we can still see markets with stalls round by the church, which is pretty much where you'd expect it to be. Um, there is also this panoramic view of um, the area of High Green. Uh, it's got to be representing prior to 1840 because this thing here, highlighted in red, the gas pillar, that was actually taken down in 1840. It was put up with the expectation there'd be a big light on the top and it would light up the town and that would help get rid of all the miscreants 
um, but unfortunately it really only lit about a 20 foot diameter around the bottom so if you were outside of that you could be as naughty as you liked really and over on the left hand side here that is the Swan Inn or this version of the Swan Inn the earlier one was uh, would have been a timber framed and then over to the right this block of buildings here this contains Lucent's High Hall but I don't think the whole of it is Lucent's High Hall for the simple fact that if you look at the roof lines and the window styles, I suspect it's probably just that block there. Meanwhile, back in 1534, things were about to get just a little bit heated. And this was all over an argument between the C election versus the E election at the office of the bellman. Town prior to you and me. Uh, here he is, a nice town crier, standing at the market cross, just shouting out the news of the day or things that it was thought the public ought to know. And we wouldn't know about it at all, really, if it wasn't for the fact that it spawned a case in Star Chamber related to riot and unlawful assembly, and the documents for that still exist. And this is an argument between James Lucent, merchant. A looks like Leveson, but he's believed to be pronounced Lucent back then, because if you read through the documents, spelling wasn't um, exactly to form all the time, and sometimes his name is spelled L-U-S-O-N, and sometimes it's spelled L-E-W-S-O-N. So going on phonetic standards, it's generally held to be Lucent. Anyway, the other person in the case was a Thomas Lucen, gentleman. They were related, but not closely. Uh, but they both lived in Wolverhampton. And the thing about Star Chamber back then was it could actually turn things around quite quickly. So what you would do is you would draw up a bill of complaint, which would then be filed with the court. Um, the accused, or be that one person or many, would be summoned to appear on a specific date at every sitting of the court until the case was discharged. And then the accused, which you probably describe as the defendant by now, would, would come, was examined under oath, and they got eight days to lodge an answer to the bill, put their view of things, basically. And most cases just have the bill of complaint and the answer. But you did, there were two more stages. Um, the plaintiff could then have an extra four days after reading the answer to the bill to make a reply, a replication. And if the accused was still up for it, they could then make a rejoinder to the replication if they desired. And in this particular case, all four avenues were used. Then local commissioners would be appointed by Star Chamber to come to the place in question and take the statements. And the Lucent case timetable ran quite quickly to begin with. So on June the 10th, this unlawful gathering took place, which we'll get to in a minute. And about eight days later, there are two witness statements dated for June the 18th, and these are local witness statements, and they support the content of the bill. Um, about another 12 days then, so it's almost two weeks, there's an additional supportive statement made by a local JP. I don't know why he couldn't do it with the others, but perhaps they couldn't get hold of him. And then 10 days after that, Star Chamber have had the opportunity to look at the bill, the answer, the replication, the rejoinder, and they've set up a set of questions to be put by the commissioners to all the witnesses. Instead of calling them questions, they call them interrogatories, but it means the same thing. And so the commission locally here came to Sir John Derham, Sir Walter Brottersley, and Sir Thomas Morton, and then we get the big gap, three months, <laughs> till the greater bulk of the witness statements were actually taken. Um, I don't know the reason for that, but one thing that strikes me is from July to October, you've got the agricultural year running, and it might just be that people couldn't afford to take time off the land to come and answer questions. So the case, what is the case all about? <clears throat> well, in his bill of complaint, James Lucent says that on market day, 10th of June in this year, 1534, very specific, between 11 and 12 o'clock, 
40 armed people assembled outside the door of his house and he recognised 21 of them and he wrote their names into the bill for good measure. Uh, there was one Thomas Ripton who he had a bit of a history with who said that whoever came out first he would brain him with his staff which doesn't sound particularly friendly does it? It sounds like they really meant their business. Um, James says that constables did arrive to see the peace kept and basically he's saying this is not an acceptable situation. Dear court, please issue writs of subpoena to everybody named in the bill to come here and answer for their sins. Now, Thomas's answer, he uses about half of his answer to the bill, um, describing how James is always trying to put him down. Um, he describes the issue of the bellman, which is the latest argument between them. And he also said that on the day in question, he, yes, he went to James's house with just three others, quote, thinking very lovingly and friendly to talk about the bellmanship. And he said he wasn't guilty of any unlawful assembly whatsoever. Hmm. James's replication to the answer just outlines that he later went to the market himself because he was deputy to the Dean of Windsor by an agreement. Um, he saw Thomas and Co come out of the Swan Inn again a second time and they headed specifically for him where he was standing at the Market Cross. The constables got involved again and then the following day two JPs came into town and they bound Thomas and John Lewson, John was Thomas's brother, to keep the peace. Thomas's rejoinder to this replication is mostly a repeat of his answer just in different words. <laughs> And the story that emerges from the documents goes like this. John Simpson, the bellman, had recently died, so the office was void. Now, Thomas complains that James, of his high mind, as he is accustomed to doing all such like matters, just gave the office to Robert Webb, his brother's servant. And this was anti-practice, and the parish were very aggrieved by it. Uh, James claimed that he got the right to choose the bellman in his role as deputy to the Dean of Windsor, and he'd also got the agreement of Sir Walter Rottersley, who was steward of the Lordship under the same Dean. He said the election had always been done like that, and they didn't appoint Robert Webb, they appointed Robert Wem, who was not his brother's servant. And I've actually seen a document confirming that. Thomas seems to have got his information a little bit mixed up. And there might be a bit of personal aggravation, given the way he actually talks about James. He said that James was a man of great lands and substance, and he was. And having a mortal grudge and malice towards him, he tried daily to find ways and means to bring about his utter undoing. James doesn't really answer this, but he does point out in defence of his rights that as deputy to the Dean of the Manor of Wolverhampton, he is both the Lord of the Market and one half of the town. And in addition, he was the owner of another half of the town. You can see why Thomas might be a bit annoyed. So can we actually prove that? Well, yeah, we can. So if we go back to this 1750 map, uh, which is the earliest one we've got, which shows Wolverhampton, and it's thought that this problem for Wolverhampton at this point was it was very much stuck in its old medieval construct so it probably didn't look a lot different 200 years before if you just follow a, a red line that's coming in from the bottom of the map along Bilston Street up Dudley Street wiggling around Litchfield Street up past the deanery and then it disappears up Stafford Street somewhere that is the boundary between the deanery manor i.e. the Manor of Wolverhampton on the left of your screen, and Stowe Heath Manor, which used to be the old Royal Manor, on the right-hand side of the screen. So basically, because James was Dean, was, sorry, deputy to the Dean of Windsor, with which Wolverhampton was twinned at that time, whatever rights the Dean had over lands, properties, events, and all that sort of thing, James had now, if you like, purchased or leased those rights so he was in control of much that was to the left of that red wiggly line and to the right of the line in Stowe Heath Manor 
Um, I think by then he was actually one of the co-lords of the manor, again, by purchase rather than anything else. So it would be true to say, um, don't argue with me, please, because I own Wolverhampton. <laughs> um, now, here's the problem for Thomas. The Star Chamber case is not actually about the Bellman ship. Star Chamber doesn't care about the Bellman ship. It cares about something much more dearer to Henry VIII's heart. Thomas and his cohorts were accused of riot. The constables of the town had been involved, which sort of seemed to indicate, yes, there was something going on that needed managing. Uh, also involved with the local justices, again, evidence of what was going on. And there were 31 witnesses, or at least there are 31 witness statements. There are probably more witnesses than that in actual fact. But of those written statements, 13 are on behalf of Thomas, and about 18 supporting the content of the Bill of uh, Complaint, which was James's. So actually, what did these witnesses see? Um, well, they all saw Thomas and his company drinking in the swamp. Now, if the assembly outside James's door was between 11 and 12 o'clock, they must have gone to the pub quite early. <laughs> so they might have been getting a bit tamped up by now. Um, and I think things might have been getting a bit worked up because one of the statements from a barber who lived in Tetnell said that Thomas called to him through a window of the swan and asked him if he would join them to give a churl a blow. Oh dear. Uh, interestingly, he said he was standing at the top of the pavement outside the swan, which I think is a paved area. Um, many of the witnesses, whose ever side they were on actually, saw Thomas and co come out of the swan, pretty well tooled up as we would say nowadays. Um, the number of potential rioters just grows, not just as the story goes on, but as time goes on. So there's about 12 originally coming out of the swan. By the time they've got outside and a few more people have come over, it's gone to 20. And by the time all the folk have gathered round to see what's going on, it hits 30 plus or even 40. <laughs> um, and the main protagonists with Thomas were his uh, brother, John. Richard Ridley, who I later found out was their uh, brother-in-law, and Richard Forster, who I think was landlord of the Swan, and I'll explain why I think that in a minute. Um, and most, if not all, of the group were armed in a way that was inconsistent with keeping the king's peace. And this was Henry VIII, remember who we're talking about. Um, weapons included pitchforks, staffs, staffs you could accept, bills, a pike, a big black club, swords and bucklers, a gorget, which is like a chainmail collar to protect your neck. Um, there was also a sallet, which is a, a little metal helmet that goes on your head, and a jack, which is a thick padded jacket to stop anybody with an, a knife going straight into your body. Um, and witnesses said they all went off to James's house with no good intent, judging by the manner in which they went. James wouldn't come out. Who could blame him? <laughs> but after expecting a few more churls, Thomas and co went back to the swan. Although James said that they went to Richard Forster's house from whence they came, which house was in sight of the market. And that's why I think that Richard Forster was probably the landlord of the swan because the description says where the swan is. Um, that's a salad. Although they didn't all have such a deep neck collar as that. And um, here's a chap wearing a salad on his head and a jack, the padded jacket. I think this is from possibly an Italian painting. <laughs> I ideally hope so, because I've just got to stomach the idea of red legged chaps running around Queen Square in 1534. And the thing is that. Husbandman from Nietzsche said that as the company came out of the swamp the second time round, Forster's wife put a salad on his head, but the wrong way round, which must have hurt. And then he was seen to take it off again and put it on the right way. So even though you were declaring that you were about to go into battle by wearing such a thing, he still chose to put it back on his head. Um, and of course, Mrs. Forster wouldn't just have been hanging around the market with a metal helmet under her hand so if she had it to hand in order to ram it on his head she must have been in the building 
but what did these witnesses actually see? Um, now, unfortunately for Thomas, several of the statements say that this incident was probably planned in advance to a certain extent, or at least expected in advance. One of them says that on the Monday before the market, a neighbour had told him that if James and Thomas hadn't settled the matter of the bellmanship between them, there would be business and he must be with his master in harness on that day, in harness, address. whatever past the battle dress, depending on what your status in society was. Uh, two more witnesses told a friend that um, John Lewson had actually deceived them, so this is Thomas's brother, by asking them two days previously to come to the cross to see a bellman made. Um, basically, <laughs> they were expecting to come for something peaceful. When they turned up, they found it was a potential brawl. Now, lots of people said lots of things. They agreed with each other. Some were able to add bits and pieces. But one of the constables, John Howlett, actually encapsulates the whole incident quite nicely. So I'll quote him now. Uh, he was a draper. And he had a shop in or very close to High Green. It could have been the top of Dudley Street. It's a bit difficult to tell. Um, and he was selling cloth in the shop when he noticed uh, about 20 persons standing in front of it. And the group was headed by Thomas and John Lewson, Richard Ridley and Richard Forster. And he described them as being well weaponed. So in his role as constable, he took his own staff and ordered the people in his shop to go with him to see the king's peace kept. So I suppose you'd say he deputized a posse. Um, so he went outside to ask Thomas what was happening, and Thomas just said the equivalent of what's he got to do with you? Which he doesn't believe in helping himself, this chap, does he? Constable Howlett then followed the company to James's house, and when James wouldn't come out, they all went back to the swamp. Howlett then went off to meet his colleague, Constable Higgins, at the Market Cross, and a little later, they actually saw James plus his own supporters towards the cross so they warned him to keep the peace too and apparently he agreed to that but later on Thomas and co came out of the swan again and they headed straight towards the market cross and James uh, the constables with the help of diverse gentlemen and diverse other persons as well as the said towners of the country tried to turn Thomas back Thomas's main cohort were actually egging him on. In fact, they were seen to be plucking his coat to pull him forward. Um, and they just ignored, basically, the constable's report, repeated order to keep the peace. They did get driven back eventually, though, I think just by pressure of numbers and, you know, people shouting at them. And they went where? Well, they went back to the swamp <laughs> to have a bit more drink. And they had to find a £100 surety to keep the peace. As to James, who went next door to the angel. And so what was the outcome of this hearing? Oh, well, you'll be sad to hear there are no Star Chamber decrees or orders surviving. It must have been wondered at at some point because in the early 18th century, there must have been an attempt by government to find them because there was a committee of the House of Lords that put in a report uh, wherein it was said that these uh, decrees and orders were last seen in a house in Bartholomew Close in London. What on earth they were doing in a house in Bartholomew Close in London is anybody's guess, but they haven't been seen since. It is possible that something might crop up later on in a letter from one person to another, but nothing you can necessarily search for and find easily through cataloging and such. Um, possibly a fine, I would think, Thomas would have got. I don't think that Henry VIII would have ignored potential riots. It just depends how many friends in high places Thomas actually had. <laughs> oh, right. And then I said I wanted to have a little look at that building down there, a block which contains Lucent's High Hall versus the Deanery Hall up there. And why do I want to look at it? Well... That's the high hall, just to remember you. 
uh, just to remind you. And this is a 1913 photograph of the deanery, but it wouldn't be the same building that was there in 1534, because that one wasn't built till 1667. Um, Mander in his history said that uh, James Lewison was living at the High Hall, and I just accepted that. I did begin to wonder if that was right, because um, Owen Jordan, who was a husbandman from Heath Town, or just the Heath as it was called then, said that when James wouldn't come out of his house, um, Thomas and company went into the town to the sign of the swan. And I've got an awful feeling I've just lost a slide somewhere. Just bear with me a second. So we can see the swan. If James was actually um, living at the High Hall, um, he wouldn't have to come out. He wouldn't have to come into the town because all he'd have to do was come out of his door and walk up the road a bit. Um, the barber I mentioned earlier from Technol, Richard Sheldon, said that, and he described this in more detail, that Thomas and Co. went out of the Swan Door straight up towards the church until they came to a corner in Wolverhampton where was and is a street that leadeth to James Lewson House. There you can see the spirit spelling of L-U-S-O-N. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, if we go back to the map and back to the swan at the bottom, if you come out the swan door and go up towards the church till you reach a corner, you're going there. Litchfield Street definitely was there in 1534, but it was called Kem Street. If you actually turned that corner, okay, it doesn't take you straight to the deanery, but there are little ways where you could wiggle with about three minutes walk and get at the deanery. I think if he was actually living at the high hall in the green, he would have had to have turned left there. But I don't actually think that's a corner. In my view, it isn't a corner. So I thought, hmm, I wonder where else I can look and see if I can find anything that supports, you know, what I think. Um, the thing I found, which I think probably could support it, comes out of the um, Victoria County history, as it used to be known, history of the county of Stafford, volume three, where in it is said about the leasing of the deanery in Wolverhampton that one of the two lessees of 15, 16, 17, James Lewisham, merchant of the stable, so that's definitely our James, retained the deanery lease for at least 25 years, which means he would have had the lease to that house in 1534. And it's just my view, but I think if you had a building in the town where you would still get the spells, the noises, the scuffles, everything related to whatever the low-key industry was in the town at the time. Uh, but you had the opportunity to live on the outside of town where there were just gardens, etc., beyond where you lived and you were very close to the church. And it was a bigger, grander house. You'd probably go for the bigger, grander house. So there you have it. 16th century bobber boys getting tanked up at their local spilling their discontent into the streets, caught by the cops, admonished by the justices, and sent off to court to answer for their sins. Some things just haven't changed in nearly 500 years, have they? So let's be grateful for those that have. And although I know Heidi's got a question and answer session coming up, if you're anything like me, you think what you want to ask about three days later. So if anybody does want to contact me, that's my email address, or, or if anybody can contribute any information, I will be grateful. So back to you, Heidi. I will stop share. Thank you very much, Jackie. That was really fascinating. <laughs> There's all sorts going on in the 15th century, isn't there? <laughs> um, right, so it, has anybody got any questions? Because nothing's come up in the chat as yet. <laughs> hmm to take in and write questions at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, just, just an ob observation. Um, the, the Star Chamber records, which were last seen in a house in Bartholomew Lane, was it? Uh, oh, something. Bartholomew Close, yeah. yeah um, that, that's 
probably not not all that surprising oh. um, because um, the the main royal courts keeping hold of the records and storing them was uh, the master of the rolls right and that that was his business and he probably did it quite effectively yeah um but of course the court of stars chamber was not a regular royal court and so the master of the rolls wouldn't have been responsible in, in right. the same way that um quarter sessions uh, for yes. example um the master of the rolls didn't didn't keep uh, their records and certainly what happened with the um court sessions was that their records were kept by whoever was the uh county uh clerk of the peace okay. the, the 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 person who administered the court sessions and when a new one was appointed he was supposed to hand hand them over uh, the old one was supposed to hand them over to the new one and of course this very often didn't happen yeah. and there are stories of, of quarter sessions records being piled onto a cart you know to be taken apparently to the new clerk of the peace uh, and then just disappearing oh, God. And, and so you know quarter sessions uh, records are are very patchy and uh, yes. I think the same sort of thing might well have applied to the uh, Star Chamber. Um, yeah. I don't actually know but but you know some, somebody would have been appointed to look after their records and it was the, certainly an officer who changed from time to time. Yeah. The National Archives did hold some decrees and orders from other courts and I can't remember how long ago this was but by some sort of arrangement <laughs> there's a university in Texas I'd have to go back and check Ooh. had the records scanned them and in some cases for the things that were being studied by their students did transcriptions of them and um, I have sort of searched through there found Wolverhampton mentioned found Lucens mentioned but I haven't yet come up with anything that mm -hmm. matches itself to anything I know something about <laughs> yeah? yeah it's interesting isn't it really though mm. I think history is very voyeuristic <laughs> did you know when you read something like, oh, did he say that really <laughs> um, something's just come up in the chat from uh, Chris O'Brien there's a 1477 case in one of the collections for a history of Staffordshire volumes which also involves a riot and the Lucens okay 1477 <coughs> sorry my curse has gone okay I'll have a look at that that's that's Great. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they were just, I think it was the nature of society then that you just blooming argued and I saw, you were very defensive of what you saw as your rights and properties. Um, yeah, I mean, is that Lucen is, is the Lord of the Manor um, and was throwing his weight around and, for example, never calling uh, the manorial jury, yeah. then they probably had a, a, a reasonable complaint. But yes, I, th I think the, the problem for Thomas was <laughs> the riot and the political climate at the time, Henry VIII, you know, by 1534, he was well into his, getting into his slightly maniacal <laughs> view of the world. And he inherited his father's um, dread I suppose of challenge and all that sort of thing mm. um, yeah mm. it was interesting to know what happened because the talk I'm doing on Friday about Dudley Street um, also contains Thomas Lucen yeah. <laughs> at which point well, this is one where you feel sorry for him <laughs> 
a bit surprising, really, that the Rottersleys were more involved because... Um, oh, they were dreadful. They, they were an appalling lot. Yeah. <laughs> mm. There's a question... They're more like a band of brigands than anything else. <laughs> yep. There's a um, question from David Taylor, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't actually know, to be quite honest. As I said before, I picked this incident up from Mander and Tildesley's official history of Wolverhampton. And it just fascinated me. And when I found out that the document still actually existed, I thought I've got to do something about this because although there's no order or decree, there's the whole of the argument taking place within what I know is a small area where I can walk around in 10 minutes. You know, and would I have liked to have lived there then? Not on your life, I would But I would... It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it didn't happen more often. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, certainly, I think in the um, mind you, we're into the seventeenth century by then, um, when we had sort of the Parliament versus the King. I mean, there were issues with St Peter's Church, weren't there? Where sort of fighting where most of their muniments got just sort of tipped out of boxes and destroyed and the Lucian was involved in that. And it's usually the swarm in, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the first yeah. thing you do when you have a riot is to throw stones <laughs> at the swarm in. Yes. Hence the expression swarming in, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you to the person who said that it was um, interesting and humorous. Um, I don't have a book about anything to do with Wolverhampton myself. The archives has got billions of books <laughs> at Wolverhampton. It's just at the moment, obviously, they can't open. When they do open, it'll be by appointment with no random sifting through the shelves. Otherwise, they just have to disinfect every book every day. And there's just too many of them for that. Mm. But if ever you manage to get up there when they're back open and uh, under normal circumstances, you very often see people browsing through the shelves and sitting down with something and then suddenly realising it's time to go home and they haven't finished what they're doing. So, yeah. Well, we are hoping as, as the restrictions, depending on the Prime Minister's roadmap and all the rest of it, as things yeah. ease up, we're hoping to kind yeah. of open up. Um, yeah. Uh, can, can you I repeat, repeat the name? The right, it's Manda, M A N D A R, yeah. Hildersley's History of Wolverhampton. This was a book started by, oh, which Manda was it? Gerald, I think. Um, which he, he was an Anglo Saxon scholar. He was very interested in local history and his town, which was Wolverhampton. He did much research over the first half of the 20th century, um, never quite got to finish the book. Um, so uh, a local historian, now deceased, Norman Tildesley, um, stepped in at the last moment and uh, using Manda's notes, plus some notes of his own, completed it that's probably a short version of what happened, but in essence, that's what happened, which is why it's known as Manda and Tildesley's History of Wolverhampton. You can, I mean, the archives have had copies, uh, old copies for sale before now, and you can still find them on eBay and places like that. Um, it's, it's Gerald Manda. Yeah. In Chris, Upton, in Chris Upton's more up-to-date book. Uh, it is more up-to-date, but for me, personally... Um, I, to me, that's too, it's too chatty. <laughs> I like Mardra and Tildesley because it's more like reading history. <laughs> um, that's not meant to be criticism of Chris, yeah. um, but, you know, it's just I like Mardra's style better, yeah. Yeah, I much prefer the, the other way round. <laughs> oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, of course... You know that. You, you've got a head full of history anyway, Frank. <laughs> well, it's ten no, pages in three words. Not much, but if, if you don't mind my idly chatting on. Do you, do you know the disastrous story about um, Gerald Mander and, and Tilsley? Um, Gerald M Mander uh, rang up uh, Tilsley one day and said to him, I've just been looking through some records and you know what? I think I've found the answer 
to why Chapel Ash is called Chapel Ash. Oh. You know, that's a, that was a great, still is a great debating point. And he said, I'll tell you about it when I see you on Saturday. Right. And the next day, Amanda died. Oh! <laughs> And nobody knew where he'd been, what records he was looking at, or anything. <laughs> and so oh we, dear. We, we still don't know. <laughs> and thank you to all the people who were saying thank you. So I am, I am looking at the chat. <laughs> oh, I think that's me done, actually. Yep. Are there, are there any other questions, or is everybody? Everybody happy? <laughs> That's great. You can email Jackie separately if you want to. Oh, that was very nice. Yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much again, thank Jackie. You. Okay. We've got more okay. talks throughout the week, so thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>